Hello. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Mercedes Brown, Manager of Individual Giving. Welcome to Happy Hours. Yes. Uh, this is our moment to take a deep breath in and out. <laughs> that is my cat, by the way. His name is Orion. <laughs> so you might hear him in the background every once in a while. But yes, this is our moment to step away from the news and all the stressors surrounding us to take time for some joy. All are welcomed here at, at Dallas Sea of the Center. And we are committed to standing up for equity, diversity, and inclusion across our organization and community. As a leading national theater, this is central to our relevance and sustainability in the community we serve and love. We acknowledge the land beneath our feet as the ancestral home of many indigenous peoples, including the Kado, Wichita, Tawankani, Tawakani, <laughs> and Kickapoo. We honor, revere, and respect those we, who were stewards of this land long before we made it our home. And those who passed through just that Kiowa, the Comanche, and the Kapache. Apache, sorry. <laughs> Try Mel. Pardon me. And those whose names we may not never know. We also acknowledge the neighborhood we inhabit as the original Freeman's town of Dallas, built by those who were enslaved by European colonization. You want to say hello? <sighs> So I am, and so is Orion here, <laughs> we're both excited um, to have costume director Michael Wade join us to share concept and designs that he has developed over the past year. Um, the designs and concepts that um, may come into fruition in the future, I don't know. Uh, Michael, tell us more. <laughs> I know you've, there's been a lot going on um, throughout the year, so <laughs> just curious. Yes, that, what's that's what's been going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what hasn't been going on? I mean, uh, this year this is a year for the books for sure because mm -hmm. so much has been changing so rapidly, and uh, I mean, you know, this the title of this event, obstacles to, I wrote it down, obstacles to theater making in costumes, and one of the larger obstacles for me personally, you know, I work as the costume director for the theater normally, that's just my normal everyday job. However, because of COVID, because of all the restrictions, we were no longer allowed to have outside designers come in and do our shows. Uh, and uh, part of that was directly related to uh, COVID and mask wearing and things like that, but also because of the timing of shows, we didn't know, we weren't certain if a show was going to happen or not. So we were reluctant to have outside forces coming in when we weren't even sure what the calendar would be like. So what that equates to is that I became the costume designer for the season, which is very unusual. Uh, I'm not the only one, however, and the four of us who are part of the production department head staff are acting as designers for this season. Uh, so all of us have taken on this extra duty on it. We don't get to forget about our other things. We, it's in addition to everything we've been doing. So that alone has been its own obstacle in terms of managing our time, putting, putting you know, we're all uh, trained in theater. We've been in theater for years, but we don't always work as designers continuously. So kind of putting that hat back on has was for me at least was a personal challenge because it had been years since I'd actually designed a show so then having to <laughs> kind of go back and forth between being the designer and having the design meetings and talking about the show itself and what story we're trying to tell and then turning around and having another meeting about budget which is what I would normally do <laughs> and how much we can spend how much money we need for these shows uh, so that that alone has been a a huge obstacle for us uh, but um, like Mercedes was just Mercedes was just saying um, there have been a lot of shows that we've been talking about doing 
that we tried to do, that we wanted to do, that we've had to cancel or put off until another time arrives when we can do that show. I uh, actually made a list of the shows that we've gone through <laughs> over this past year. Uh, and there were How some- How many? How many uh, are there? So oh, curious to know. <laughs> it's a big, big list. I went back through my old emails because uh, we had, you know, in, in planning, we have calendars and scenarios is what we refer to them as. We started with scenario A back in, it was last spring when we started with that. And by the time we got to fall of 2020, we were on scenario U. That's how many versions of the calendar and the budget we had been through. And shows, some shows carried through the whole way. Some shows we cut, we added shows. Uh, but I mean, because this all started back with American Mariachi. You know, we we actually got that show up and running. We had a, we had a preview, I think. And then it had to close. And from then on was the, the great weirdness of 2020. <laughs> yeah, we, and that cost, and the costumes in American Mariachi were amazing. They, they really <laughs> were beautiful. That was a really good example of like showing really the good craftsmanship that the department does. Cause I believe that was a show that everything was built practically, correct? I wouldn't say that everything was built. The show is set in the seventies, I believe. So we. We did purchase a lot of the the streetwear that like the day looks that kind of you can still purchase that online pretty easily etsy's a really good place for that if you're into it uh but we built a lot of the mariachi costumes those looks were built by the shop and they uh they're really they are lovely they're really lovely uh but uh part of what was happening with that show, the intention we were gonna have our run here and then it was gonna leave us and go to the Goodman in Chicago. And that never happened. We still have it. <laughs> it's still in its boxes. It's ready. It's, we're prepping it to be shipped because I think the Goodman is actually gonna produce it in the fall now. Uh, but that's been a back and forth over the year about when when can they do the show? They're not sure. So we're just going to hang on to it. But there are conversations back and forth about different dates and timing. And when can we get the cast? And because that's that's a whole nother problem. Uh, but I think it's finally going to happen where I, next week is the we're packing the truck and prepping it to be actually leaving Dallas. So that's kind of exciting. Because it is a really good show and yeah. it was really beautiful. So maybe it'll have the run it deserves. Mm -hmm. I love how you already identified what I think two, three different obstacles <laughs> like <laughs> the cast schedule, the budget could prevent something, and you know, unforeseen circumstances like a pandemic. <laughs> but, um... Oh, it's super easy to identify obstacles. <laughs> That's... <laughs> But then right um, after, oh, go ahead. No, the one other thing I just want you to break down real quick before you um, show us um, some of you, um, the work or the conceptual <laughs> like ideas. Um, what, what's the difference between a costume director and a, like a costume designer? Because well, those are two separate disciplines, separate like roles within the theater man. They are separate roles in most theaters. I mean, you'll, you'll find a lot of smaller theaters they have one person shop situations so that which is where a job that I used to have I was the designer but I was also the only staff person in the shop so I built everything I bought everything I did all of that uh, but in a place like DTC the roles are are divided in a more appropriate manner so the designer that is the person who who they decide what each character is going to wear. They make decisions about the color, the style, you know, what, what period is the show set in? That's going to inform the designer about what they should research. Um, but then how does the color affect the character? What does it say about the character? The designer makes all of those decisions and they translate those decisions on paper in the form of renderings. Um, Sometimes we'll, we just get imagery that's not necessarily a drawing 
because if they can if they can provide an image that's accurate enough that we can work from then that's fine too uh so that's that's the the gist of their story um uh, but the custom director is more about receiving those drawings or that imagery from the designer translating into how much time and money and effort are is it going to take to realize these drawings on stage uh, how can we get them from paper to the real thing so i will translate information to the draper who is the person that makes the patterns for the costumes that we're going to build the draper will translate the patterns to the fabric cut them out and translate instructions to the stitchers about how to build the costume. There's also in our shop, we also have an associate costume director and she focuses on uh, purchasing. So if we need to order a bunch of clothing, uh, she is good at sourcing and finding the clothing. We actually call her nickname is Search and Destroy because she's so good at finding things <laughs> that we need. <laughs> that's that's just her, that's her bailiwick. So she does that really, she does that all the time for us. Um, she tracks all of that. Um, but in addition to that, she kind of keeps, keeps an eye on the finances and makes sure we don't spend too much money because that could happen really easily. Um, and then we have some, we have other people in the shop and it just kind of, staggers away from that and gets more and more specific as you pull away from from the director part uh, and i make sure that we have staff available to help in the shop if we need it depending on the show uh, so those the custom director is more logistical and the custom designer is more about the artistic feedback about the show if that helps clear up that that distinction Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Because I, I know there's a distinction and um, sometimes that could be confusing and, you know, you don't really know. <laughs> sure. Of course, yeah. 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 So you are able to share your screen. Okay. <laughs> so do you okay. have anything to show us or any I, like? I can show and I didn't, I didn't make it all super neat and pretty because I thought maybe I'll just show you the reality of what I'm dealing yes, with. Yes, we want to know how it really is. I mean, do we all agree with that? Yeah, we want to see the real. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. Um, yes, Marla, I see your drawing right there. <laughs> <laughs> when I sometimes when I realized, yeah, sometimes it has to be like a little squiggle, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. That's how it starts. <laughs> There's some variety in here, so I do have a I use. Uh, the Google Drive a lot. And so in that, it's, a, it's an easy way to collect imagery, to share imagery with other people, like the director, like the other designers. Uh, so I have one Google slide document that has every show that, let me think, I because I removed some a couple mm -hmm. of months ago, when, once I realized that, oh, that show is not happening anymore, let me take it out of there. Uh, but there is still one show in there that we we got pretty far into, but we never actually did it. And it's still in there, so I can show that one to you for sure. The rest of them are shows that we we did actually do, or we're still going to do them. Maybe they were postponed. Uh, uh, so let me share my screen. This is gonna be the wrong one at first, but here we go. Okay, so well, actually, let me take it back. Instead of just presenting it to you, I'll show you what I look at all the time. So this little sidebar right here is just plate after plate after plate. There's so many, it's taking a minute to load. I'm scrolling through too fast of different shows. And I ended up dividing them by, <laughs> so that I could easily reference them. The different backgrounds indicate different shows for me. So like this green background, that's working. 
this lavender background is the magical show that we never got to do that I'll tell you about in a second. And then there, uh, I will uh, zoom in on these shortly, but uh, just so you get a feel of how many there are in this one little document that I scroll through all the time. And I think I've removed three or four shows that used to be in this document that are no, that were no longer relevant at the time. So I took them out. But this first show with the dark gray background was in the Bleak Bend Winter, our adaptation of A Christmas Carol that we filmed. Um, how I had to work with this show, I did do some, it was a mix of some drawings like this little pencil sketch right here and then finding imagery relevant to that character. And this character, uh, in this version of Christmas Carol, like, like most versions, uh, you saw a lot of passage of time, or I guess more specifically, we saw flashbacks of time. So we saw this same character who was played by the same actor in multiple stages of her life. So we saw in the present version, which was the oldest version of her, a kind of lower middle age. She wasn't middle aged necessarily, but um, mid twenties or so, which was past flashback number one, and then past flashback number two was an even younger version of her. Uh, but you can see just imagery that we're finding from the internet to specify different characters. Some more drawings when we have to get specific with characters. Uh, let me scroll down and then, oh, then there are some characters like this guy who is the, the ghost of Marley. Now, this was an original incarnation of the ghost of Marley, but, you know, <laughs> Per the norm for this season, this also changed. The look of the look completely changed. So what you saw, if you watched in the Bleak Midwinter, what you saw didn't look like this at all. In fact, you probably couldn't see much of him because it was so dark. His costume was black. The lighting was very focused on his face. So a lot of <laughs> the rest of his costume was just, you just couldn't see it. Um, let me skip down to uh oh there's a show that was canceled that we're still gonna do so i'm kind of reluctant to show you because it hasn't happened yet although uh this is a show where only having these four people in it only four looks that's all we had i actually did more of a full-size rendering this is the only show <laughs> that's had full-size renderings because the rest of them ha were happening so quickly or they were changing so rapidly. I didn't have the time to sit down and do this. It just happened this particular moment. I could. Uh, and then this show paused. And uh, while we are looking at continuing it later on, uh, a lot has changed and I'll probably end up redesigning a lot of this because these people are not the same anymore. So when the cast changes, uh, I'm based a lot of these decisions on what the actor looks like, what their, what their body type is like, what their skin tone is like, what are they gonna look good in that informs my choices. But if it's a different person, uh, wh who, which I don't know who they are yet, but that might, depending on what they look like, that might really change what I think they should wear. Um, hey, Michael, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, it's Robin. Um, so the the uh, ghost of Marley, you know, that that kind of went away and became the, the black costume. What why did that change? Is it is it that you, the designers are talking and like the lighting designer says, actually, we're just going to have a close up of his face. So you don't need the cut. Like, how, how do those changes come about? Part of that is it's just conversation and as it develops it's also some of it comes down to while this might have been ideal an, an ideal of what we really wanted it does come down to oh I'm going to kind of focus on their face anyway so we're not going to see a lot 
or I realize we don't actually have the time or the the resources to build this kind of a costume. Uh, so it it's usually more than one variable goes into why something evolves like it does, uh, but it it's really just a part of the process. It there there is evolution all around, and even if I were to skip through a lot of these, uh, of course these are just images that I found on the internet that that speak to the idea that I want, but I certainly didn't have this exact argyle sweater vest in my stock. Um, so I found one that was reminiscent of it or had the same vibe to it. Uh, so that if you were to look back at pictures of in the bleak midwinter, you'd probably find an argyle sweater vest, but it was not that color. And that's just part of the evolution of, of, of this process really. Have you ever, I'm sorry, I have a follow-up. You're fine. No, no, no. Have you ever like absolutely loved the design of a costume and you had to let it go? And if so, like, what is that like? Do you have to kind of distance yourself from a look that you might really, really love because it might go away or? Um, yes, that has happened before. Uh, I, I think you have to be, well, you can get attached to certain things and maybe what, whatever, barrier is coming along that's that's trying to push you away away from that look there are i mean maybe it can be slightly altered in some way how can you overcome that barrier with minimal changes while keeping what you love about it intact um and sometimes that just doesn't work sometimes you there is a beautiful gown that you've been working on that that the actor looks amazing in and you realize that scene has been cut from the show and there's nothing you can do about it. So you just have to think that dress would have been really amazing on stage. <laughs> and I was really proud of that look and it's gone forever. Uh, but si similarly, uh, sometimes you'll have a really fantastic elaborate costume and it's on stage for five seconds. And that you just have to live with. <laughs> that it was a blip on the stage and it, and it took Maybe it was the most expensive thing in the show that took the most time and it was a blip for sure. That absolutely happens all the time. Uh, let's see. One, one thing that I have learned over the years is sometimes these costumes have to be very quickly changed. The uh, yes. actors going off one side of the stage and comes back on the other side seconds later in different costumes. Does that impact your design? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, a really some really good examples of that uh, would be for working, uh, which is coming up, um, because working only has uh, seven actors in the show, but there are thirty-ish characters in the show. I think maybe more than thirty. Uh, each actor. I'll show you this one. So each actor has between five and seven different looks to, for each different character that they are portraying. Um, so that, so costume changing is integral. Uh, so I do need to put, this, this is an okay example of this. Uh, so like this first costume that's on the left, you know, it's not, super special on its own. It's a button-up shirt. He, he's an office worker. So he's got his dockers on, his button-up shirt. He looks business casual. Uh, and then he transitions to a fast food worker. So what I'm, what I'm planning to do is he only changes part of his costume. He keeps the pants, he keeps his belt, keeps the shoes. He changes his shirt to the orange polo and then adds the matching orange visor. And once he does that, he will look more like what you think a fast food worker uniform might look like. And uh, so I had, to, I had to plan that the pants that he's wearing could work for both of those. And that's a pretty uh, minor example of that. Let me see some, 
more interesting examples might be, oh, this guy. So top of show, uh, we have this character named Mike Dillard, who is an iron worker. And he has a very fast change where he becomes Rex Winship, who is a hedge fund, hedge fund manager. So going from a uh, physical laborer to business attire on stage without any help, that is <laughs> how I've had to, de as, as the designer, determine what he wears in each one so that he can look appropriate and still change that quickly. So really all, what, what's gonna happen with this one, he'll have his Rex Winship suit on without the coat and without the dress shoes on. He'll have coveralls and a safety vest, a hard hat on top of part of the suit. As he's changing, he'll just remove the vest, the hat, the coveralls, He'll have to change his shoes and add a coat and he'll be done. So that does, Im so that absolutely impacts the decisions that I have to make for each character. Um, the timing of the show. Working is a, a bit of an anomaly for costume changes because uh, Tiana Blair, who is the director, is re really loves the, the idea, you know, this show is about working. It is about everyday people, essential workers doing their thing. And we, uh, she really wants to show the work happening on stage, our work happening on stage. So we will see actors changing their costumes right in full view of the audience because that's a part of their work as actors. There are moments where we will see the wardrobe crew come out on stage and help them change so that we can see the wardrobe crews work on the show. Usually, you know, we try to hide the, the backstage crew. We don't want to see them in context of the show, but in this case, it's the opposite. We want to see that work happening just because of the nature of the show. So that's been uh, different and kind of interesting and fun to, to think about because then I have to be concerned about what the wardrobe crew might be wearing. You know, uh, this this show also because it's a musical, it also has a band. So I'm also thinking about what what does the band look like when we see them doing their jobs by playing their instruments. Uh, but also wanting to be able to see all those people without it being too distracting from the story that the actors are telling. So yes, that absolutely is. Uh, this is another good example of that. This middle dress, the floral, she goes from this dress to, uh, which is a, which is her character is a housewife. That is her, that is her work. And she transitions to Roberta, who is a sex worker. And that is her work, but that change happens on stage. So how can I get housewife to sex worker so that the actor can make that change on stage without, you know, of course we're not revealing any, any personal body parts or anything like that. <laughs> That's not happening. So how can I do that with this change where, where the actor can perform this change by themselves? So we are building this house dress, or it's not a house dress, we're building this dress for the housewife and it has a special closure in it that she can open it herself and, and she'll have the next costume on underneath it. And what is underneath it needs to be shaped in a certain way that we can't see it when the house dress, when the housewife's dress is on top of it. So that that idea also really informs the shape of these costumes because one has to hide the other one. Ooh, Michael, uh, this is Mercedes. I have a question about that. Yeah. Of um, does that mean that the choreography of even like the um, transitioning from outfit to outfit, do you um, take that in consideration 
now that it's the actor doing it rather than the dresser doing it? It is a consideration. Uh, in this example, mm -hmm. um, the housewife, because she has to remove it herself. Mm -hmm. So it has to have a closure that she can reach. She has to have a place to leave the dress on stage. We don't want it just to land on the floor. So there will be, there will be a specific rehearsed way that she removes this dress to reveal. And there have been some changes happening about what the next costume actually looks like. So it might be a little more involved than simply taking off the dress to reveal something else. She might have to add a few things. So that will be rehearsed. It'll be timed how to, because we, they have to plan how much time it's gonna take because there are other, other actors involved is she changing while someone else has a monologue happening? What music is playing? How much physical time is there for her to change? All of those variables will dictate how, how she changes. So, it, it, I mean, in a way, it will be a, a type of a dance. Uh, let's see. Uh, so that's... That's kind of the gist of working. Um, I did want to show you a sh show you a show that uh, we did a lot of design work on. We had site visits. We spent a lot of time considering what we were going to do. I spent a lot of time in our storage facility pulling costumes that I thought might work for this show, uh, but the show never actually happened. Uh, maybe you remember hearing about Dissolve. Dissolve was a show, and it's really not a traditional scripted show. It's more of a performance art piece. Uh, this was going to happen at Fair Park in the band shell. Uh, and it, it was something conceived in the rehearsal space. So the director and all the actors were a part of this. They spent time deciding what, who they were as characters. They spent time deciding what story they were telling, their movement, their choreography, all of those things happening at once in the rehearsal space. So we're, as all the designers are on the outside of that, receiving the feedback about what's been happening, what's developing, and in talking with uh, the director, you know, she initially had an idea that uh, because what she initially thought it could be was that everyone is bringing whatever they wanted to the show, to the space, and whatever we wanted to bring is what they would use, which seems a little scary because you don't know what I might bring. But uh, it, did, it did adapt a little bit to uh, having very specific type character uh, stereotypes. So one example is we had a character who was the femme fatale. But that's a little, it's a little that the notion of what a femme fatale looks like is a little vague. So then that meant I'm, I'm doing research on femme fatales. What do they look like? Who, who could she be as a femme fatale? So uh, these smaller pictures in, uh, down here, let me see if I can enlarge them so you can look at them. These smaller pictures like this one and this one, were some initial imagery that I found. This is where I started with the femme fatale. Two very different ideas though. Uh, but where we settled was more of a, if you know who Dita Von Teese is, a uh, very well-known burlesque dancer and a uh, fashion icon, I believe. Uh, but that is who is pictured here in the perfume ad and in this, well, they're both perfume ads actually, um, but she is, she is known for her very fitted, 
tight uh vintage 30s 40s kind of vibe so we were gonna head there and we were gonna head in this direction and i sort of ended up with the uh the big chiffon robe with the boas the i just murdered my husband robe that i called it please come help me that kind of feel for her uh being the femme fatale of course uh the next character was uh, for Blake Hackler, if you know who that is, he was our Scrooge in in the Bleak Midwinter. But we were doing a little. We thought it'd be fun to do a little uh, gender bending, so we thought maybe a little tuxedo Marlena Dietrich look might be fun for his character. A little old Hollywood glam. Uh, and then I have some other pictures that show uh, we were going to have that uh, that that detective. Uh, the, that kind of staple character that you always think about, very, very Dick Tracy. And when I saw the image of Dick Tracy, I thought, oh, that's the one I'm going to use because I already happen to have this red and black striped suit that fit him, or it should fit him. And then I thought we could get a really fun color fedora just to, because, you know, Dick Tracy had that bright, bright yellow hat and the bright yellow coat. And I thought we need a really bright, kind of off kind of strange color for his hat so that's that's kind of where we were headed with him um and then each character just we had a show girl so i was inspired by this piece that we that i found in storage um uh, make it larger so it's easier to see it's this uh little uh, romper, basically, that, you know, it's just covered in sequins in this geometric sort of art deco uh, pattern. And that made me think, oh, maybe I can base this showgirl off of uh, some of Erte's work. Erte, very famous fashion and costume designer. Uh, this center image is his design of the Queen of the Night from Die Zauberflöte, the, the Magic Flute, if you know that opera. Um, that's the image that he drew for that character. So I thought I might be inspired by that, maybe build a really fun, overly large headpiece for her. Because uh, there was, the, the beginning of the show was, uh, she was gonna walk out and slowly parade across the stage into, into like oblivion so if she had this huge drape of fabric with her and this elaborate headpiece um just basically stealing all the attention and being being the showstopper uh, and then uh, we have a we we never really decided on what we were calling her sometimes we call her the queen sometimes we called her the goddess sometimes we just called her the diva but uh, I really responded to these uh, images where this this contrast of the dark and the light, and I was really going to play with that. I was we were doing research about finding a dress that that matched her skin tone, so she if she all looked like like a statue almost, but then maybe she had uh, this golden hair and you know. Uh, very specific pieces of her makeup were oddly bright colors so we could focus on that uh and then of course we have some that don't like this is very silly very goofy uh but a cowboy essentially and part of part of what we were really trying to show with this piece was that um, is the what the illusion of theater can be. So what we thought would be fun is if we had things that were made of really mundane objects and from a distance, because you know a, a lot of the time in theater, uh, you can't see because of the distance of theater there's a lot of things you can't tell. 
Uh, so I thought maybe we could make him some chaps, but maybe they're actually made of mops. So from a distance, maybe you would not know that they're made of mops. Uh, but then when he got close to you, you'd suddenly realize, oh, this, these are just mops. It's something mundane and from, the, from the, the grocery store, that kind of thing. But it was that transition of illusion to reality as the cast moved closer and closer to the audience, which would have been interesting at the band shell at Fair Park. If you've never been there, uh, the space is huge and the audience would have been really far away if the cast were on stage, but there was tons of room for them to come down and get really close to the audience. So they, they would have had both experiences of that theater, that magic theater illusion and the re reality of what the costumes look like up close. But uh, a few other characters in that similar vein, but you know, more, more than, more obstacles were happening than we could that we could control. So we ended up not moving forward with this show, unfortunately, because this, this probably would have been one of my favorites that we had done. Yeah, and I think, um, this is Mercedes, um, you know, it was really unforeseen circumstances we couldn't even control with that oh, one. Oh, sure. Um, but that doesn't mean it won't come back. <laughs> There's always potential for sure. There's always potential to like, <laughs> like you know, this will come back uh, in some sort of shape or form now that, um, you know, CDC health regulations and concerns have lacked. So um, who knows? Who knows, Michael? <laughs> who knows, everyone? Because I was also excited about this and I was also like, no, but um, out of our control. Yeah, but it was just great to see all the different concepts and drawings and how you put your mood board together. I found it fascinating that it's all in the same file and you can just kind of scroll. Well, <laughs> and what's, what, what, what I guess is, uh, has been a little bit easier than what might normally happen is that I am the designer and the costume director, so I can just have conversations with myself and make decisions about <laughs> what's going to happen. And I'll, and as as I'm designing, I'll know, oh, that's going to be really expensive. So I can prep myself for it when I get back to my budget and know that I have to accommodate that in some other way. Uh, so in that way, I can, I can work a little faster because of that. But uh, I don't think it's worth it with all the other obstacles that come along with it. Yes. Yeah, so, well, I mean, we have 15 minutes left. Um, um, does anyone have any questions in the space regarding what they saw or like maybe like the style in which um, like the research for even costume is compiled or anything? Feel free to open up the mic. <laughs> anything. <laughs> I yes, I see you, Larry. And I want to know about his wallpaper. Oh. <laughs> she, wants to, she wants to know if you painted it. I want to know if you painted it or, or if it's really wallpaper or fabric. It's gorgeous. You know, yes, well, I also found it very gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so here's the story. You've been telling us all about costume and design and all that, and she's been focused on your wallpaper oh, all I this know. time. <laughs> it's well, beautiful, you, though. It's so beautiful. <laughs> let me tell you, though, when I, when I first jumped into the Zoom room today, uh, Robin kind of said the same thing. She thought it was my... She thought it was the wall in my apartment. It's really not. It's just a. It's a digital background. Oh no! Really? <laughs> it's just a. It's a picture that I found. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> but I like I it. It's it's pretty, huh? <laughs> it's fabulous. It is fabulous indeed. <laughs> so, what percentage of the time uh, do you go to? the warehouse or the production company or wherever all the uh, past costumes are stored and things like that versus uh, either going out and buying it versus making it as far as an average. Good luck. I, let's see, we probably, I, I do spend, when I'm pulling for a show, I do spend a good amount of time in our storage facility because I, especially this past year, I've been trying to conserve 
mm -hmm. uh, monetarily. So I want to I want to reuse as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So I will go and I'll spend the whole day digging through our storage facility trying to find things that'll work for that show. Uh, and this this particular year has been low on the what we're building end. Mm -hmm. Just because it's been a little strange. I mean, of course, with all the show changes and things like that. Mm -hmm. But besides that, with our COVID restrictions, we there are we're limited on how much time we can spend in the shop physically. So if we're sewing, most of the sewing we do happens in our own homes, and and most of us have sufficient sewing setups. But it's just a little bit more of a pain to do it at home than to do it at the shop because at the shop we have the big tables. We can mm -hmm. lay stuff out, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so we've, we've, there's been a big mitigation of what we needed to build this year. Uh, so I, I'd say it's, it's about a half and half purchase and pull mm -hmm. and maybe like a 15% build. So what's your relationship when it comes to designing the clothes and everything with hair and makeup? Uh, how when do y'all get involved with each other and who comes first well uh it's usually the costume will come first because we're trying the costume designer is the one who decides how we're portraying this particular character or they're 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 more in that process first and then we we in in that the weeks that precede uh rehearsal are the weeks where we start pulling in the hair and makeup folk and we're like okay this is kind of what we're hoping that this character looks like but that but the hair and makeup supervisor also has to account for all the same things that i do in terms of like quick changes because sometimes we have mm -hmm. a, a quick change that includes a wig yeah so the timing on that's important how can we make that as simple and as quick as possible uh, what what did the like for working as an example if we're changing care costumes on stage, maybe we need a hairstyle that works for both of those characters. Mm -hmm. So the actor doesn't need to worry about that mm -hmm. because that would just be another, another and, and changing your own hair on stage, maybe without a mirror, <laughs> that, that probably wouldn't be the most successful kind of change. <laughs> if I could do one more question, do the actors themselves uh, have any kind of input into their costume and you know how they look on stage yeah they I mean it sometimes it's the timing isn't ideal because the designers have been working on the looks for for months generally uh, trying to figure out oh, what should they look like and then they'll have them on paper and the actors get to see the renderings as well but once the actor has gotten into rehearsal and they're actually working through each scene, they might discover that the character is someone different than we kind of thought that character would be. Okay. So then we're, then it's just another conversation. They'll come back and say, you know, after going through, and it actually happened today. <laughs> after, after talking about it and rehearsing it a little bit, we're kind of seeing the character go in this direction. So could we, could we rethink what this character looks like? Could they go, could we view them in this way instead of this way? So then I just have to respond and say, oh, okay. Uh, that's not how I was originally thinking of this character, but that still makes sense. How can I change it uh, so that it still works for us in our timing? Uh, Cause you know, with something happening like, like today's change, uh, I'm planning on having costume fittings next week. Mm -hmm. So if I'm having a costume change, a design change right now, I need to be able to acquire those pieces before the costume fitting so that I'm not wasting a lot of time trying to get the actor to come back again later to try something on that I didn't have, you know, it's yeah. logistical things like that. Uh, oh. But that, yeah, that happens all the time. And sometimes they, they, sometimes it's nice because they can bring uh, more feeling to it uh, and more in-depth idea about who that character could be. 
and it's based on their own experiences and you know the experiences they have with the script itself you're so flexible and i love your beard love oh. <laughs> your beard. thank you fantastic thank you. thank you for the answers i really appreciate oh, it oh sure and you like you said flexible is kind of what we all have to be because because there are so many variables things things can change really rapidly and as we know and being being flexible being adaptable is where it's at i have a question yeah sure, sure. okay uh, okay this this cuts back to personal experiences with uh with shows uh at the uh theater um when you're doing uh, a poetic kind of a show, uh, one of the great tragedies, maybe or Shakespeare or something like that, uh, the problem I have with it is that sometimes it seems that the uh, the minimalist approach has minimalized it to the point where I can't tell the characters apart anymore on stage because they're all dressed in suits and they're all dark suits and. You know, uh, I and I have found this to be a problem uh, in cop, well, a couple of the things I've seen. And I've just wondered, uh, not that you chose that particular way to approach it, uh, to do it in modern costume and to, uh, you know, to minimize it and let the poetry come through on its own. But uh, have you pushed it too far sometimes? I mean, I've seen shows that, that kind of resemble what you're talking about. Uh, I remember seeing a Richard III years and years ago where it, it was set in, you know, some kind of modern high powered executive type yeah. setting. So all the men were in very dark business suits. Uh, and, the, you know, they, they might have had small little details that were different, the color of their tie, maybe had a, a variation in their in a pin or or just their the, the tiny details. But They're some so of that far. might be, yeah. it might be hard to, to see that sometimes. So and that is that is a part, I, I can see that being a problem if in terms of shows you might not be familiar with already, mm -hmm. if you're not it does inhibit the storytelling, I think, if you if you don't know who everyone is supposed to be. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> um, and I that comes down to artistic decisions, design decisions that were made um, for that particular piece. Yeah, it's I but I, I see your point. I've definitely seen shows like that where it's it's a little hard to follow because they all look the same or even if it's like a greek or a roman show and it's it's set time appropriately so they're in Everybody. togas or you know something along those lines and they they look so to our eyes they look so similar yeah that it i could see it being a problem telling them apart and that's where it's the designer's job to to be able to help tell that story mm -hmm. without confusing everyone yeah, in my opinion, costumes are the most important part of the the component of telling the story. I mean, not so much the set, like the costumes, his, um, you know. Well, I think it's, they're, they're telling different parts of the story, though. Mm -hmm. Like the costumes are telling you about who the people are, but the set is telling you about where you are. Mm. And maybe it's it's helping determine the circumstances of those people. Like if you've seen La Boheme, you know, it starts off in kind of a ratty, dingy apartment. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. giving you a feel for their uh, their class status. They are very poor. So mm -hmm. this is the this is the kind of place they live. And their their costumes are also going to reflect that. Uh, but then they'll get specific about little details about hints of who that person is in mm. addition to the, the setting yeah uh, does anyone have any thoughts to share about this topic one of one of the uh uh plays the costumes uh when kevin 
put somebody like a different gender into a role than what you expect. That's got to be a real opportunity for the costume to uh, pro, you know, portray who you think it should be in your mind. <coughs> Get some water, Michael. I didn't mean <laughs> okay. to choke you. Yeah. I, oh, I know, because he's like, that's excuse a good point. <laughs> <laughs> One second. Um, no, that is a good point. And there are also variables in that as well. If, if the character is written as a woman, let's say, but we're casting a male in that role, well, are we changing the character to a male? Or is it going to be... Or are we still trying to have the character be a female? So am I dressing them to present as a female or as a male? There's, there's that small distinction too, because uh -huh. uh, that, that is also happening in working. We've, we've switched some characters around a little bit. I won't that, tell you too that, much about that one because you can go watch it. <laughs> now, that, that's one of the most interesting things about the Dallas Theater Center about how Kevin you know, uh, produces and what he produces and how everybody that's involved in the production puts it together is you kind of never know what to expect when you get in there unless you've come to a happy hour or, you know, have been there for a long time. I, I sometimes I feel sorry for people that think they're getting one thing and then get there and it's something totally different. And we try and talk to people that we hear maybe at, you know, intermission, you know, that are expressing some concerns and say, oh, just go with the flow. You'll really get the message if you just open your mind to what's, you know, being presented before you. Yeah. Uh, a long time ago, well, a long time ago is relative. Last year it lasted about ten years long. <laughs> Everything before that was, but there was the uh, the, the the show uh, the trials of Sam Houston, mm -hmm. and I mentioned because of the way the characters change in kind of mid sentence. The uh, I mean there was there was one character that played three characters, and. Of course, one actor that played three characters. And of course, there was no costume change. Uh, and it was three different periods. Mm -hmm. He was an older gentleman and then a very young uh, senator, I guess, congressman. Anyway, uh, and I told, I told Denise at the time, I said, this is getting confusing. They have to include little electronic signs that they can change with their name <laughs> and an instant so you can say ah oh, i see <laughs> yes that was a perfect example <laughs> well, I, I remember that i remember the feedback was who's who and it, what i mean i know there was some costume change involved like halfway midway but um maybe not as a uh, Maybe too subtle in that case, you know. Well, yeah. I don't know what your thoughts, was... Michael. Because I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I think maybe that is the case because I I'm pretty sure that all the characters had different. Now it might not have been a complete costume change. Right. But maybe it's a let me add this coat. But the the style in which they were doing it, you're right. They didn't necessarily stop talking. But right. they're chain they're adding stuff while they're talking. And uh -huh. so it yeah. became this kind of blend of a of of a in the moment costume change. Uh, so I could see how it could be confusing, but those are the moments where the costume designer has to be a little clever about what that character is adding and how is it gonna make them seem like mm -hmm. a totally different person. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. those little bitty moments like that. Yeah, but that made the show unbelievably fascinating as well. I mean, oh yeah, there was a confusion factor, but it was like, <laughs> oh, we're still talking about that show, obviously. <laughs> that was yes. our first show at DTC. Yeah, 
I I definitely remember that show. And there was a lot of costumes involved in that show. Yes, there were. There sure were. Was that your first show, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, cool. There you go. (laughs) Well, it is past our time. It is past um, 6.30. It is nice out. If you like the heat, I'm I'm sure you're going to go outside. Or you want to go a little later when it cools down. Either way, um, just thank you everyone for uh, being here in our Zoom space. Um, we are.